Peace be with you. Dear friends, today we celebrate the Feast of the Epiphany of our Lord, and I'm so glad you've joined us for this holy day of worship. If you receive emails regularly from St. John's, you will know that we have closed once again to in-person worship. But we're so glad that we can continue to hear God's word together and to lift up our hearts to God in prayer through this online service. We're also meeting at 9.30 a.m. on Zoom for our Sunday Connection Bible study week by week with morning devotions as well. If you'd like to join us uh, in person online for that service, we do welcome you to do that each week. And you can find details on how to join at our parish website, and there's a link to that in the video description below. Also, if you're not receiving emails from us at this time and you'd like to stay up to date on all of the news and events of St. John's Parish, you can also find details on how to sign up for our email list there as well. We begin today by pondering the words of St. Luke's Gospel in the second chapter, verses 1 to 12. Now let us hear these holy words together. In the time of King Herod, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, wise men came from the east to Jerusalem, asking, Where is the child who has been born King of the Jews? For we have observed his star at its rising and come to pay him homage. When King Herod heard this, he was frightened and all Jerusalem with him. And calling together all the chief priests and scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Messiah was to be born. They told him, in Bethlehem of Judea, for so it has been written by the prophet. And you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For from you shall come a ruler who is to shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod secretly called for the wise men and learned from them the exact time when the star had appeared. Then he sent them to Bethlehem, saying, Go and search diligently for the child, and when you have found him, bring me word so that I may also go and pay him homage. When they had heard the king, they set out, and there ahead of them went the star that they had seen at its rising, until it stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw that the star had stopped, they were overwhelmed with joy. On entering the house, they saw the child with Mary, his mother, and they knelt down and paid him homage. Then opening their treasure chests, they offered him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And having been warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they left for their own country by another road. This is the Gospel of Christ. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. Well, friends, this Epiphany feast caps off the Christmas celebration by commemorating the visit of the Magi, the wise men from the East to the Holy Family in Bethlehem. It's something of a strange feast, if only because these wise men from the East are some of the most enigmatic figures in the Gospel. Who exactly were they, and how did they come to believe that a new king would be born in Israel? Quite often in our tradition, these magi are referred to as the three kings, but that may not be the most helpful title to give them. The term magi, from the Greek magoi, is close to the Latin magister, literally meaning master. Magister is a title often reserved to those who are not masters in the sense of being master of one's own domain or the master of the house, but rather as a professor or a teacher or someone who has attained a certain level of learning might be called a master. I've got a degree on my wall at home that says in Latin, magistri in divinitate, master of divinity. And having earned that degree, I am, in Latin, magister, though it would be very strange indeed if anyone started calling me that. So who are these magi? Well, we know for sure that they were men of learning, 
that they were masters of their field of study. And it seems that it was a particular field of study that led them to make their journey and bear their gifts to the new king. Specifically, they say, where is the child who has been born king of the Jews? For we observed his star at its rising. We observed his star at its rising and have come to pay him homage. The Magi, you see, had carefully studied the night sky, observing the movements of the heavens and seeing there a sign which in their reckoning, according to their mastery of their field, indicated a consequential event happening at a particular place in a particular time. You see, they were in their way and at their time men of science, of learning, of knowledge, who had deduced from their learning and observation and knowledge this momentous event. Now what happens next? The Magi make their journey toward the direction of the star and they go to the place where you would reasonably expect to find a king. They go to the palace and greet Herod, the king of Israel, and make their inquiries about this newborn king. And Herod, though he was a murderous, corrupt reprobate, probably without a truly pious bone in his body, nevertheless calls together a learned assembly of those who were steeped in the Hebrew scriptures to point the Magi in the right direction to the city of David, Bethlehem, where the long-awaited Messiah was to be born according to the scriptures. And while Herod begins scheming and plotting the massacre of the innocents, the Magi travel to Bethlehem and greet the Holy Family, opening their gifts to the infant Jesus. And then what do we hear? The Magi are warned in a dream not to return to Herod, but to depart from home by another road. What's going on here? And how does this story, this feast, speak to our present day, our present condition, to our world right now? Do you know that surveys have shown that one of the principal objections people have today to the Christian faith in particular and to religious faith in general is a belief that faith is incompatible with science, or more broadly, that religious faith cannot be reconciled to scientific reason, that one cannot be a person of reason and a person of faith. What I want to say to that, first of all, is that that idea is a staggeringly new one. In fact, most of those early scientists who contributed so much to forming the foundations of what today we consider the heights of scientific inquiry were themselves religious believers of one kind or another. Take one very familiar example, our number system. The numbers that we all learn to name and add and subtract as small children is Arabic. It was developed by Islamic scholars deeply entrenched in their religious tradition. Finding patterns showing the perfection of God's good creation and expressing it in a system intelligible to all. But more modern Christian examples come to mind from Descartes and Mendel to Newton and on and on, all deeply religious scientists. And even today, when most scientists would not describe themselves as religious believers, there are still a great many who hold to traditional religious beliefs and do not view these beliefs as incompatible with their vocations, quite the contrary. I think of Francis Collins, a committed Christian who led the Human Genome Project and has been in the news a lot recently in his capacity as director of the National Institutes of Health in the United States. Collins wrote a wonderful book a few years ago that I heartily commend to you called The Language of God, A Scientist Presents Evidence for Belief. But leave the individual religious convictions of scientists aside for a moment, though it is notable. On a broader scale, this notion that somehow religious faith and scientific inquiry are opposed to one another, somehow at loggerheads, that faith and reason do not or cannot coexist is a corrupt idea from the start. And the Epiphany story demonstrates like a beautifully painted icon the falsity of that way of thinking. 
that science and faith are incompatible. What led the Magi to seek out the newborn king? Science, the high science of their day. Astronomy, the observation of celestial bodies and their movements. A field of study which they themselves were masters of. But what lay at the root of their inquiry? Do you think it was a desire to create a sort of narrow, clinical, empirical set of data to then sit back with their arms folded and pour over it and say, well, isn't it interesting how all of that stuff just accidentally came together and then take a coffee break? Well, evidently not. <laughs> no, it strikes me that these magi were invested in looking at the heavens, looking at the natural world, and learning about not just what their eyes could see, not just what was intelligible to them by observation, but also learning something more about the intelligence that lay behind their observations. Looking at their observations in a deeper way, if you like, to discern there something about both creation and creator. And it is their scientific inquiry which sets them off on their journey, a religious journey, to find the newborn king of the Jews. It was their observations and their rational, reasoned deductions from these observations that led them to the deeper truth that lay behind what they observed. You know, I think it's instructive that in the wonderful prologue to St. John's Gospel that we hear on Christmas morning each year, that John meditates on the word becoming flesh and living among us. Now, word, as it's presented there with a capital W, is a decent translation of the Greek. And it gets us a long way toward what John conveys in his gospel, but it's not quite all the way there. As you may be aware, the Greek word is logos. The eternal logos of God became flesh in Jesus and made his dwelling among us. And I think it's worthwhile to meditate just for a second on that word, logos, and to find the deeper meaning that John means to convey. The logos, the logic, the wisdom, the divine mind that created all that is and all that ever will be came into human flesh in Jesus of Nazareth. That is the earth-shattering news of Christmas. And so the Magi's discovery of the babe in the manger could rightly be termed the greatest scientific discovery of all time. For what is science but an ever-searching quest to observe the logos at work? To observe what holy wisdom has created, to study the divine mind. And here the Magi had come upon that logos in the flesh. By observing the creation, they were led to the creator lying in a manger. And that's at the root of all scientific inquiry, if you ask me. You see, it's an utterly false dichotomy to carve up the universe and say, this here belongs to the realm of human reason, and that over there belongs to religion. Well, no. All things belong to God. Friends, open up your Bibles at home and read Psalm 19, which says in part, The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament shows his handiwork. One day tells its tale to another, and one night imparts its knowledge to another. Although they have no words or language and their voices are not heard, their sound has gone out into all lands and their message to the ends of the world. It's a hymn of creation. God's good creation is itself a kind of story, the psalmist writes, telling of the Creator's handiwork. It is a song singing the Creator's glory. 
You see, all inquiry into the nature of that creation is for God's greater glory. It magnifies the creator. It doesn't diminish him. For it tells us more and more about the logos, the divine mind at work. I heard a wise preacher recently who was meditating on this same topic, and he pointed out that almost all of the sciences use a suffix derived from the word logos. Think of it. Biology, physiology, psychology, virology, immunology, etc. All of these have something to do with logos, he said, because they all have something to do with objective, patterned intelligibility. And where does that come from, he asked. The world's not just dumbly there, that's very clear. So does it strike you as a reasonable position to believe that it's simply some wild cosmic accident? That every nook and cranny of physical existence is marked by patterned intelligibility? On the contrary. The existence of patterned intelligibility, which can be found in all things, points to the existence of this logos, which has spoken all things into being. And that's why, my friends, this bizarre modern standoff between science and religion is so unnecessary. It just simply doesn't compute for me. Scientific inquiry is ultimately a way of knowing not just the patterns that we observe, but by knowing them, to know more about the intelligence that is their source. Now take it back to the scene at the crash. What's going on there? Well, the God who sent the universe spinning into being by a word has come to share in his creation has taken flesh of the Virgin Mary, his mother, and become a human being. And there are the Magi, masters of their field of study, who looked to the night sky and studied its movements. And that scientific undertaking, that observation of the patterned intelligibility that is observable in the universe, led them to the creator of the universe in human flesh. Here is an icon of the false standoff between science and religion, but more than that, an icon of where all human inquiry, all human observation, all human striving will ultimately lead when it is rightly ordered to the creator of all, to the logos, the wisdom, the mind of God. So let us glorify God by learning well and deeply about God's good creation, by thanking God for a universe made intelligible to us and for those who devote their lives to its study. And may all human inquiry, all human observation, and all human striving lead us closer and closer to the mind of God. And God bless you. Amen.
worship the Savior with joy and make our prayer to our Heavenly Father, saying, Lord of glory, hear our prayer. The Magi came from the East to worship your Son. Father, grant to Christians everywhere the spirit of adoration. Lord of glory, hear our prayer. The infant Christ received gifts of gold incense, and myrrh. Father, accept the offering of our hearts and minds at the beginning of this new year. Lord of glory, hear our prayer. The kingdoms of this world have become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ. Father, grant an abundance of peace to your world. Lord of glory, hear our prayer. The Holy Family lived in exile and in the shadow of death. Father, look in mercy on all who are poor and powerless and all who suffer. Lord of glory, hear our prayer. Your son shared the life of his home and family at Nazareth. Father, protect in your love our neighbors, our families, and this community of which we are part. Lord of glory. Hear our prayer. Father, we rejoice in our fellowship with the shepherds, the angels, the magi, the Virgin Mary, and Saint Joseph. In your unfailing love for us and for all people, hear and answer our prayers through your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. And now, as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to say, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. May God the Father who led the wise men by the shining of a star to find the Christ, the light from light, lead you also in your pilgrimage to find the Lord. May God who has delivered us from the dominion of darkness give us a place with the saints in light in the kingdom of his beloved Son. May the light of the glorious gospel of Christ shine in your hearts and fill your lives with his joy and peace. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be amongst you and remain with you always. Amen.